Jane, thanks so much for coming onto the show. Yeah, thank you for having me. You were thinking very deeply about programming languages, but then you left academia to start Akita Software. Do you want to talk a bit about your background, what you're working on, how that transition happened? I can just tell my whole life story from the beginning. Perfect. I grew up、uh, around computers. Both my parents are computer scientists. We had a terminal before we had a PC. Our first PC was a Gateway 2000, and so I grew up programming. My parents taught me Basic. They taught me Visual Basic. It really clicked for me when I discovered the internet and web programming. So I, I loved making websites because it was a way of connecting with other people in the world, and it just felt bigger than making my little games in Visual Basic. I never thought I would go on to become a computer scientist. I just thought this was something people did. But junior year of college, I took compilers, I took hardware, I took programming languages, and that was a really transformational time in my life because what had seemed to me like air we breathed or the ground we walked on was something that you could actually shape and have a say in. That was the moment when I was like, yes, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. I want to build the tools that construct the world that I live in. I, I've always been a very virtual person. I live in this very virtual world. My interest starting around then was to build better tools for web programming specifically. One of my life missions is to make people realize they can demand more of their developer tooling. The time I graduated college, that was 2008. Most of the tooling jobs in industry had to do with performance, and I wasn't really interested in perf. I felt like there's got to be better ways to program, and so I went to MIT. I got my PhD. During my PhD, I worked on a new programming model because I had learned in school, you know, the way you improve programming tooling is by working on a new programming model. And this is when I started realizing I didn't think programming was about the languages at all. Towards the end of college, I got Very interested in this idea of why is nobody in industry using all these nice languages I'm learning about in school? So I, I interned at Google summer 2007. I used to write to my programming languages professor every week, like dear Professor Morstadt, I'm at Google. No one will talk to me about this OCaml business. No one will talk to me about ML. Everyone is rewriting stuff from Java back into C++ because they can't afford the memory overhead. What's going on? Help! And I think after a while he was like, "This is summer vacation. You need a break. I need a break." We all need a break, but I, I was just really obsessed with this idea of there's so many good ideas. Why, like, why aren't they out there? I started thinking. I don't think this is about the programming languages anymore. I think there's this kind of slow evolution of programming languages, but you have this evolution of systems on top of the programming languages that I feel like is more the wild west. A lot of people think that the silver bullet is new languages. I just don't believe that anymore. At the language level, it might seem fast, but compared to like. What's been coming out of research? Everything in mainstream languages has been around since the 70s, but the wild west of programming these modern systems. One thing is what I call the software heterogeneity problem. You have so many different components in a modern system. How do they fit together? And how I first came upon this was I built a programming language. I started building web apps based on it. I called out to the database and I was like, Oh no! All the guarantees I spent the last year putting together have been completely subverted by the single call to this other. Runtime system. In these modern systems, what you have is this situation where where you have so many different components. Any single language doesn't actually make that much of a difference anymore, in my opinion. And then the other thing is these systems are so complex and they all build on top of each other so much. There's this huge legacy problem. And so I think that where the big land grab is now in terms of programming tools is if you can solve the problem of emergent behaviors in modern distributed systems, and you can solve the legacy compatibility problem. That's where there's. There's big leverage to be had. What do you mean by programming model? There's a lot of things one can mean by programming model. Previously, when I thought about programming languages work or modeling programming languages, I thought about it at the application level. You know, lambda calculus. But I think that my personal view has been shifting. You can zoom one level out in these modern systems, and you can think of it as like. You have services interacting, and there's another programming model, what I call the API graph, so the interaction graph across your modern distributed systems. And for web specifically,、um, what I think is really nice is that there are APIs to talk about the boundaries. And just to give a breadth of how I think about programming models, I spent a year after my PhD before I was an assistant professor at Carnegie Mellon, working in a systems biology lab. We were modeling protein-protein interactions using this rule-based language. Synchronous concurrent language. There was stochasticity being modeled. That actually, like a side note, is how I got really interested in asynchronous concurrent 
programming models like microservices. But, you know, there we were programming models to simulate protein-protein interactions. And that view of the world was actually very mind-altering for me because it, it really made me realize, like, most systems that can be characterized and like, especially systems that you can actuate things in, like you can think of them as programming systems. I have a friend, Lucas Sway, who did his thesis on contracts and microservices environments. So like, how do you enforce contracts in these environments? How do you express contracts? And um, a lot of the work they drew upon was stuff for modeling chemical processes. In these biological and chemical systems where you have emergent behaviors, like people are actually forced to model asynchronous behaviors. People are forced to model like these emergent things. In modern systems, there's a lot of lessons to be learned from that kind of thing. Previously, a lot of people looked at these complex systems as things that were possible to architect in a top-down way. And so you could say, this is what I want my system to do. This is how the components are going to fit together. This is how it's going to interact. But in the last five, 10 years, especially spinning up a new service has become really cheap. Architecting things has become much more organic. You know, I might be making this up, but it seems like the role of the architect now is to look at the system that has emerged from the teams, a bunch of teams moving fast and trying to characterize what actually happened instead of um, designing this thing where all the pieces are fitting together very intricately. And so I think that a lot of the previous distributed systems work presumed that you could, um, you, you had more of a top-down kind of approach to this. But with the rise of service-oriented architectures, microservice-oriented architectures, software as a service being called at the API level, um, there's really a lot of just organic system emergence uh, happening. It's getting more and more important to connect what's actually going on in the code with something that people can understand. And this thing is, is not designed anymore. It, it happens. <laughs> Makes sense. You know, when a senior engineer is at a whiteboard drawing a bunch of boxes and arrows between the boxes, it sounds like you're trying to kind of formalize that. Oh yeah, absolutely. So we're not the first people to try to formalize that. Leslie Lamport won the Turing Award for his work on formalizing things in distributed systems. Butler Lampson also, like many Turing Awards have been won for distributed systems modeling. Turing Awards have been given out for all kinds of other program modeling. I think the new point of view that I have on some of this stuff, one is the heterogeneity requires like a different way of looking at programming. Because I think that like a lot of the modeling has been disconnected from the actual code itself. There's a way to bridge, like, let's start from the code and model upward. And like, let's start with the high level and model downward. That's one piece that I'm really interested in. The other piece is I think a lot of people think about specifications as something that you know what they are and you can write down beforehand and you validate a system against. And when you're a senior engineer drawing those boxes, the assumption is you know what the boxes are. My assumption about the world is no one knows what the boxes are anymore exactly and how they fit together. And so this is this is the legacy problem that I'm talking about. And this is tied to the first thing I'm talking about, uh, I talked about, which is if you want to model these heterogeneous code systems and there's a bunch of existing stuff, you need tooling to characterize what's going on <laughs> in these like really complex systems with emergent behaviors. That's different from the top down. Let's think about what we designed here, where we know where everything's going on. Got it. So if you look back decades to what people were saying about programming, you have people like Dijkstra or Tony Hoare. They were introducing lots of very methodical ways to do programming. But how would their ideas work in an environment like today's? What I am trying to do is build the right infrastructure so you can be more methodical again. Because <laughs> back in the day, like if you're dealing with a single recipe, you can be like, yeah, weigh the eggs or weigh the flour and you know, make sure you have exactly this level of thing. But when you're operating at such larger scale, like larger scale of software, larger scale of who's being served, larger scale of all the other entities you're interacting with, you just can't afford to be methodical about the low level parts anymore. And I think that we're in a situation where there's not really constraints on people to be methodical about the higher level things because like, you know, compute is cheap, memory is cheap, everything is cheap. You can just get users coming and going. I, I read um, the Everything Store about how Amazon came to be and they, you know, it took them years to build up that initial infrastructure. And I was like, why did it take them so long? They could just use 
oh wait, they were the ones who built up the AWS infrastructure for so that anybody else could do this very easily. It's just very easy to do things these days. And it's both very easy, so there's no need to be methodical, but there's no best practices about how to be methodical. Because for anyone who's thought a lot about abstraction, most abstractions are broken. And so before it's like, yeah, if you were dealing with just the instruction set or you were dealing with a lightly abstracted language on top of machine instructions, you can be very methodical. If you're memory constrained, if your computer is very slow, you have to be very careful, but no one has to be and no one knows how to be methodical anymore. What we're trying to do at Akita actually is to give more structure to modern cloud computations and, and the emergent behaviors that come up across services to give people more more of a solid footing and not not a completely opaque abstraction to build as a foundation, but a less shaky one than, than they currently have. Let's talk about Akita. Who is somebody that could really benefit from Akita's product? What are the higher level problems that you're trying to solve for them? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. The big one right now is um, catching breaking changes and giving some idea that like nothing bad is happening in your system. And who we're solving this for is individual developers. So developers who um, they maintain a service that's either internal or external facing, they, um, they're moving fairly fast potentially, and they want to make sure nothing bad happens. They want to be able to ship code more quickly by having this extra level of assurance. Other people we're solving this for are tech leads who have like multiple of these developers moving fast. They're responsible for making sure that the code review process is actually catching stuff. It's really hard to catch stuff with code review these days. And then also architects overseeing some governance aspects across multiple services. Like they have an even harder time, like the more zoomed out you are in this a chain of trying to understand what's going on with your software, harder of a time you have. And then another similar role is actually security engineers who are also trying to do some kind of governance, who have a hard time figuring out what's going on. Very cool. I think especially after we had a couple of blog posts about API breaking changes, a lot of other API companies have also started saying they can do breaking changes with their thing. So cl clearly it's like a hot thing. Here's how what we do can help you. And here, um, here's the limits and here's what I think differentiates. So what Akita does is it takes snapshots of your system behavior, basically potentially at every commit, if that's how you set us up to do. And what we do is we capture things like what are the data types, like what are the endpoints we saw at a very basic level? What are the basic data types that we saw for those endpoints? What are the finer grain data types that we saw for those endpoints? And then we also have like, what other services are you talking to to start building up a map of dependencies across your APIs? Um, so what we're able to do right now is when you check in code on the pull request, we say, these are your endpoints that were modified. These are your data types that changed. And so this can already start giving you um, an idea of like, okay, this is an endpoint that changed. Um, somebody else might be like, hey, <laughs> I had other stuff depending on that endpoint. You should probably let me know. You can like start subscribing that way. What we're able to do with the picture of the API graph that we built up now is also tell you like, we know what each service is calling. So we can be like, these are services that are depending on this. Maybe you want to check with them. And so there's already like more information than right now for going and checking across different team members for when you make breaking changes. Where we're going with this, the place where we're going hard on doubling down on um, what we're building is making the diffing much more precise, making it much more powerful. And so right now it's fairly coarse screen compared to what we have in mind. We tell you like this endpoint got modified. This is what we saw different. But, you know, as we build up the contracts, as we build up, you know, this is exactly how inputs to your service are flowing out of the outputs. You can imagine the false positives and like the amount of human checking that needs to go there keeps on decreasing. Gotcha. So I've taken a brief look at your product and here's what I've managed to piece together so far. Yeah. You have a service, you run the service locally, you run the Akita agent on the same machine, and that agent magically tells you what API your service actually adheres to. Yeah, 
Yeah, absolutely. So um, the way we see it is that right now people are doing code reviews using like source diffs, which don't tell you anything about how the code actually behaves. And so people don't know until they run their code, sometimes until users are using their code, what actually might be a breaking change, what might be a data leak, what might be a lot of other things. And this is quite expensive. It's pretty inefficient. And if you, especially if you think back to the kind of discipline and the kind of methods people have for programming decades ago, this is just so, so different from that. And in fact, most things people learn about good software engineering practices, they actually don't make sense. So like an example of something we discovered is most people don't actually have extensive tests. But if the only way to really get a good feel of what your system does is by looking at how everything interacts, it makes sense that the incentives are not actually that good for for writing tests because to like do a good job of testing, you just have to do so much work. So where we want to go is to give people something better to diff, to understand what's going on with their their code. And so like source code is not the story anymore. It's really what is my code doing? And so what um, what we're doing is taking snapshots of your system behavior and we're expressing those as API specs. What we consider system behavior is like what's going on, what's crossing your APIs, what's entering your services, what's exiting those services, how do the inputs and the outputs relate? What happens to an output of a service after it leaves a service and goes to another service? If I if I have um, a piece of data coming into my system from a user, where does it end up? What services does it ultimately touch? Like who does it affect? What's its journey across the system? Those are the kind of questions right now that logging and monitoring do not tell you. Um, those are the kinds of questions now that if you have any kind of visibility solution, it gives you like one point in time, like did we see this piece of data, but it doesn't tell you anything about the trajectory or the story of that kind of thing. And so what we're doing by having this agent that watches each individual API is trying to piece together this more structured information to take a, like snapshots of the API graph over time. Just for context, what are the nodes and the edges of the API graph? So the nodes are the services themselves, you know, like a payment service or a checkout service that has its own API. And the edges are data that goes across each like path that data can take essentially. So if the payment service calls the checkout service, that forms an edge. When we have the fine-grained API graph, what I'm really excited about is saying like this argument of that call forms its own specific edge. And then you can start like that level of granularity of reasoning will give you really nice, precise results. So right now, your standard APM tool will give you the very coarse grain model, which is there could be a call from service A to service B. In my opinion, this is not super useful because in a microservices system, pretty much any service could call any other service. What you really want is specifically like which endpoint um, that's already an improvement. And then like the specific data relationship is what I think we should go for, for the edges. Cool. Checkout service calls payment service somehow. What sort of things would you want to tell the programmer? Okay, so in this in this setting, we have checkout service calling payment service. We have a make payment endpoint, and then we have specific data types. Eventually, like in the fine grain map, it would be great to know that checkout service sends this specific data to make payment. So there are a few things that it would be great to know. One is if payment service changes error codes or payload structures, checkout service should know. If make payment changes data type for the input, that is helpful to know. For data leak purposes, it would be really great to map out if a specific argument goes into make payment and then ends up in logs, ends up called out to a third party, let's say make payment called Stripe, and then it sends Stripe something it's not supposed to. The ideal case is, is you can actually trace like pretty precisely this is where it came from in, in checkout service. Um, instead of saying like everything kind of has to be reversed and fixed. If you change payment service, you know exactly what you need to look at in the checkout service in order to maintain compatibility. Yeah. And I think that in the, in the two service case, it's a little bit helpful, but you can imagine every time you add one more hop, you kind of fan out your potential dependencies. Right now, if everything depends on everything, that starts becoming a lot, a lot of services and a lot of functionality to have to start examining. Here's one thing I'm imagining. You run your service, it crashes saying invalid token ID. And you're like, what the heck? And then you can see, oh, token ID came from this call, which came from this call, which came from this call. 
And then it could be like, oh, wait, something went wrong here. Right, right, exactly. Because if you think about debugging in a monolithic setting, usually if you have a bug, it's not just like it was in this function, but it was, you know, maybe like three functions down the call stack. And so being able to see your call stack, being able to see your call graph is really helpful for debugging in these monolithic settings. But right now for these distributed settings, you don't have the same thing. It's basically like debugging and having your hands tied so you only know the function that called you directly. Let's say I'm a new engineer just joining a company and I want to understand what this complicated distributed system does. Like when a user wants to add an item to their shopping cart, I want to understand what is happening in this complicated backend. How would I do that with something like Akita? Yeah, absolutely. If you're onboarding onto a new service, um, we can just watch test traffic or even prod traffic to the service with our agent. We'll give you back a summary of what we saw of your service behavior, and we express it as an annotated API spec. Something that we're doing that I don't think anybody else does is then we start inferring additional properties on top of a basic spec. This is why I say we're building models. We're taking snapshots of your behavior. So one thing we do is we infer uh, precise data types instead of just string, because everything is string. We tell you, okay, it was this RFC data format, and we can leverage the structure of the API to like sanity check and have higher precision on that. Something that we're in the process of doing is implicit contracts. So how do the fields of an API actually relate to each other? And so this also goes back to our conversation about specs, because most of the time people think about specs as something people write, but my view on a lot of this stuff is nobody knows what their systems actually do, especially because they have these emergent behaviors. They're, you know, amalgams of different services, they're, they're composites, but everyone has a notion of what worked and what didn't work for the system as a whole. And so I initially started thinking about this from a security perspective, like no one knows what their access policies are supposed to be. And so like techniques like specification mining. So like looking at what people actually did and inferring this is what people want are super useful in these contexts. But then like, so so on top of a basic spec, we're starting to infer more high level properties to take more precise snapshots of system behavior essentially and um, give you a better substrate for diffing. What sort of programming language magic goes into inferring those sorts of higher level properties? To be very transparent, I, I would say like initially it's pretty basic. The big insight there is leveraging the structure of the API spec is very powerful. There's both, you know, heavy duty programming language magic, and then there's like a programming languages way of viewing the world. And I think initially it's really like taking a very programming languages view of the world because most other people that I see in the space of like, we're going to try to figure out what's going on with your system. They're throwing like unsupervised learning, like machine learning techniques at this stuff. My point of view is structuring a problem always makes it easier to solve when it comes to programming. Part of our magic is we've structured our inference so that we're leveraging the structure of API specs in the best way possible. I think it's a series of really clean engineering decisions that gives us most of the power right now. We've also set ourselves up for inferring these contracts. So I would say like the big wins actually come from just like engineering the system to leverage structure. And then a lot of the stuff that's PL magic, I would say is, is the wow factor is the icing, but it's not the main cake. Gotcha. Gotcha. What was the motivation to do this by watching traffic as opposed to by asking programmers to instrument their existing code? Oh, that's a really good question. So we went back and forth a lot about that. Initially, I thought that we would take an open tracing kind of approach. Um, but what we realized is that the systems that ask programmers to instrument their code seem to encounter friction among their programmers. And so for us, we're like, well, our big win is if we can spread really quickly throughout the whole system very widely. And it seemed like for a lot of the systems where code gets instrumented, people will instrument like their most critical services, but then there's a bunch of random stuff that doesn't get instrumented. And actually that's the places where we think we have the biggest wins. It's often how your stuff interacts with random stuff that you thought didn't matter that um, is very crucial to giving you the whole picture of your system. And so we wanted to give as complete a picture as possible into these systems. And so we wanted to reduce friction as much as possible. Very cool. Can you paint me a picture of, let's say, five to 10 years from now, the life of a web programmer and the sorts of incredible capabilities that they might have? I think right now, 
web programming is a little bit like where medicine was in the middle ages. So, you know, something goes wrong and you're like, maybe leeches and like something else goes wrong. And then you're like, maybe bloodletting and no one really knows what's going on. And then eventually, you know, they figured out that if you just drink more water, like so many more people would just not die. And I feel like <laughs> there's going to be a lot more known about web programming in the next five years. Like here are the places where we're losing massive amounts of efficiency. Here are major sources of bugs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so I think that people are going to realize so many places where life could have been made easier. I think a lot of these places will have to do with cloud and distributed programming. I think there's a lot of stuff that's just straight up hard here. There are known hard things. I think there will be known better practices for staying away from those hard things. But um, yeah, we're we're in this situation where everyone is accidentally doing distributed programming. It's been known to be hard for a very long time, but there aren't really good practices to keep people away from the hard parts. There aren't really good practices to give visibility to like shepherd people into things that are reasonable behaviors having to do with it. And so I think that there's really going to just be just a better understanding of like, this is the zone you should stay in. You should always drink water. You shouldn't do some of this stuff. It's not good. Some of these incantations you often do, they don't actually help. And I think there's just going to be more like enlightenment um, around some of this stuff. We're kind of in a decadent era of programming where people just throw things over a fence. There's not really tests. There sometimes isn't even like staging tests. I think some stuff is going to have to change. What's the path from here to that sort of a future? What needs to change? Probably some worse stuff has to happen. Because I think we're also kind of in the Middle Ages right now where they're just like, oh yeah, sometimes people die. And then later they're like, oh, they got dehydrated. But I think right now people are like, oh, sometimes there's just catastrophic software errors. Eventually, I think people are going to be like, oh, it's because like these pretty basic things are happening. So I think probably some worse stuff has to happen. I think the standards around like how much code gets tested and like how you do code quality is going to have to increase. I think that up to now, that's been very unsexy because it's been extremely manual. It's been highly error prone and very tedious. But I think the right kind of automated tooling and not the wrong kind of automated tooling is going to help a lot of this. How did these areas become unsexy? Why isn't it cool to have really high quality software? Software quality hasn't really become a consumer interest. The users of software don't really have very high standards of software. It's really interesting because safety in cars is like a big thing because people are like, if my car is not safe, then we're going to die. And actually like I have family members who are very anti-luxury, but they're like cars. That's the one thing you have to buy as a luxury good. Otherwise you die. And like, you have to buy it new, not new use. Otherwise you die. And I think that there is not the same sense for software. And I can't yet tell why. Like, I, I don't know if it's because software is this like other kind of thing, but the luxury version version of software is usually like software gives me access to like more cool people, but not like the software is more reliable and like doesn't lose my data and doesn't do this and doesn't do that. And I can't yet tell if it's because it's just too abstract and people don't care or people haven't developed a notion of like, this is better. Do you want to live in a building that might fall down and doesn't meet building codes or do you want to live in a building that like pretty much stays up i don't know i feel like maybe now people are like we live in a civilized society and you know our apartments shouldn't just fall down while we're sleeping and if there's a fire overnight we shouldn't just die and like i don't know if it's just like societal norms haven't caught up or if software is a fundamentally different thing I think that people don't even have a notion that if you built the software differently, things could turn out any different. Because I think that for some people, they're just like, I do things and then something happens. And like, people can't even tell like software that works correctly from buggy software at this point. Jury's still out about whether it's like software is fundamentally different or, or something else. But I think that 2018, um, there was a fundamental shift because um, Cambridge Analytica demonstrated that like, even if people don't know how to care, they should care. GDPR demonstrated that again, even if people don't know what the standards should look like, there should be standards because there are harms. Um, that come from software not doing what it should be doing. That was a big motivation for for me feeling like it was the right time to start Akita. Like those are those, those are two of the big motivators. I felt like finally society had reached an inflection point where like people 
even if they don't know how they should care, know that either like regulators should protect people or people should be like demanding that protection themselves. But it's no longer just about like lobbing software over the fence and like crossing your fingers. People are currently doing a lot of different things to try to raise the quality. They're doing code reviews. They are trying pair programming. They're doing unit tests. They're trying to write integration tests. Some people are using fuzzers with varying levels of success. Some people are doing model checking. It's like an endless list of different things you could do. How do you see all those fitting together? How do you see your work fitting into that or superseding some of that? Yeah, no, I think that's a great question. I think some of the stuff right now is like the, you know, middle ages incantations. I think some of the stuff works and some of it doesn't. I think like good testing works, but like I said, in these modern web systems, it actually makes sense that people aren't testing their stuff very much because you can't see how stuff behaves until it hits like it, it hits those interactions that you don't get until prod. Fuzzing is really cool. It uncovers a lot of basic issues. But again, like it's really like how does your code actually behave in prod and what's the picture of that that I think it, like really matters. Model checking, it's not connected with the code. So cool. It makes you think more about your spec. But like my view is no one knows what their spec is supposed to be. And specs are actually massively unsexy. And so like how I've been thinking about specs, it's, it's really like a found spec. Um, I think maybe it should be called something else. But I, I don't think people want to write these things. No one wants to. To, like plan stuff very much anymore. Um, and I don't think anyone ever really did. Static analysis, some of it's helpful. It catches like very basic errors, but I think some of it is just another incantation because it tells you everything that's possible in your code. So you can run it and it can make you feel better, but it gives you so many false positives that no one's actually checking some of this stuff. And so I think that like the stuff I'm trying to do is characterize and snapshot the current behavior of a system in a way that is automatically diffable, but also somewhat understandable to the programmer. And so I think like the language of specs is interesting because it's a really good way to convey back to the programmer what you notice about their program. Like, sure, people thought about this as a way to like write down what you meant about the program, but no one no one knows what they mean. But it, it's also like co-opting that to convey back to the programmer, this is what you intended, I think is a really good use of it. Um, what I would like to see is more and more things that actually um, give you properties over legacy code. Visibility, not just in the sense that we'll snapshot like which values went over this particular network edge, but like, let's actually tell you what, like what your system did. We're one effort in this stuff, but I, I would love to see more stuff that tries to characterize your system behavior. I would love to see more stuff that gets at the API graph. So there's stuff like GraphQL uh, tooling, like they, they are also getting at the API graph. Their cell is if you buy into our GraphQL universe, GraphQL everything, then we can map out everything for you. I think like the goal of that graph is really where we need to go. Like you need to structure that. And what um, what we're doing is we're saying, well, you don't like, we'll meet you where you are. You don't need to, to have GraphQL everything. And we understand most of you aren't going to have GraphQL everything. And so I, I love the work on, you know, like Apollo, Hasura, those companies are like, if you need that graph, you can do it by GraphQLing everything. I think that's a start. And I think that like what they do with structuring the graph will be educational for all of us. But then there's this other like, legacy code problem that we're solving. I think other people are kind of getting at, but I think a lot more people should be solving in the future. Makes sense. Do you have any closing thoughts about Akita or about the future of web programming in general? A lot of people get into programming because they think it's fun. Most developers I talk to their view is that programming should be boring, is boring, and requires a ton of boilerplate and like pretty painful stuff. And, you know, it's not fun. People should demand more of their tools. I remember when I interned at Google in 2007, there was some kind of orientation meeting and someone talked about how, oh, you know, they're like the three people at Google writing Haskell, those lucky bastards. And that sort of got me wondering, well, why is it that this level of cleanliness only is available to such a small number of people? Because programming can be delightful. Programming can be much better than what it is. Where are people getting tripped up in programming and how can we help them? Because I think on the one hand, I would like to think that most people didn't get into programming because they think life should be miserable and, you know, nasty, brutish and short and whatever. On the other hand, programming tools are so unsexy and people aren't actively trying to improve themselves. And I, I think there's like collective jadedness about what programming work can be. 
And I think a lot of people are like, oh, well, you just think this because you know, you don't have to do this boring, mindless, mind numbing stuff day in and day out. But I think, you know, most of the work that I was doing in my, my research area, most of the work in software engineering research, it was all nominally to reduce boilerplate and make programming less boring. Like maybe everybody wants a boring job, but I don't actually think that's true. And so I think that programmers should think more about like what is actually delightful about programming where can it be more delightful and ask more of their tools because if people thought about their programming practice as you know other people think about other things they consume i think there's way more you can demand and then at the next level there's there's way better quality consumers can demand of software but i like i don't expect so much but i think developers know better <laughs> than to demand what they do of of their current experience of development. If we can get developers to realize that they can demand more, I think there can be a lot more innovation and everyone's lives can be better. That's a fantastic point to end on. And yeah, finally, where can listeners find you on the internet? I personally am on Twitter. Akita, our webpage right now talks about catching breaking changes. We're very actively trying to work out the kinks of our early product to make it really good for a larger number of people. So we would love to have people try out our private beta. We have a private Slack. Most people seem to talk in private rooms on the Slack right now. Maybe one day we'll get people talking in like the actual community rooms. But if you join that, we can always make you a private channel to talk to us directly. I also personally have a weekly live stream on Fridays called PL Talk with Hongi Hu, who's a security engineer at Figma. The whole mission of that is to demystify some of these programming languages, formal methods, topics. We also have a Discord for that. There's almost 200 people on that Discord. It's pretty cool. It's a pretty fun place to be. Thank you so much, Jean. I really enjoyed our chat. Great meeting you. Thank you for talking.